Good morning, and welcome to Canard Church of God. We are um, going to dig into our second message in this series, Transforming Culture Through Transformed Lives. Today, we're going to look at reach. Last week, we began unpacking what it looks like to transform the culture around us through lives that have been transformed and compelled by the divine love of God. We looked at how Jesus perfectly lived out the greatest and second commandments to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. How many of you were a little bit more intentional this week, loving others and loving God? Amen? A little bit more aware of that. And if you were here earlier, you got to see some of the uh, pictures that were um, circulating on the announcement loops, what our kids are learning um, in the service, what they learned and drew about last week about love and kids we're going to look forward to hearing from you this week if you if you want to share at the end of the service about what you learned today okay um, today's key value is reach reaching out to others as the body of christ to fulfill the great commission and i have a brief video clip that speaks poignantly about the power of reach All right. 
Um, it never ceases to amaze me um, how we can have such deep feelings of compassion and concern for animals. Any animal lovers out there? Yeah, we, we love our pet, pets, don't we? Um, and yet daily, we see filthy, stinking, homeless souls enslaved to alcohol or out of their minds, strung out on drugs. On our TV screens, we see starving men and emaciated women with barely the strength to hold on to their dying babies who have bloated bellies. Whole families and communities of people, thousands upon thousands, suffering in refugee camps, fleeing war-torn homes or famine in the land. Every day, we see people who are teetering on the precipice between life and death, heaven and hell. And so often, we walk on by or quickly change the channel without blinking an eye, like we don't see them as eternal souls for whom the Father has so much love and for whom Jesus died. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? How com much compassion and care we can have for animals. And yet, human beings, sometimes we walk right on by. And most of the time, I think, especially for those of us who are believers, um, it's not because we're calloused, but because we're so overwhelmed. There's so much pain and suffering in the world. We honestly don't know where to start or how to help. We don't realize or truly believe that our little is much when God is in it. Amen? So how do we begin to reach out? Well, first of all, we need to understand that God... God is always at his work. Amen? Uh, and he's working all around us. And it's he who invites us to join him where he's at work. We will usually have to make some adjustments in our lives in order to join him where he's at work. Thirteen days before Mark and I got married and I thought I was going to be moving down to Arizona, the USA, God said, I've got a different plan for you. I want you to stay here in Castlegar and let your name stand for a pastor of the Canary Church of God that needs a pastor. How many of you know that we can't just think about things? It's one thing to think about and to know that there's a need. There's another, it's another thing entirely to make adjustments, to make changes in your life in order to come into alignment with God's plans. But there's always a crisis of faith that comes. Well, not always. A lot of times, there's a crisis of faith, and we have to decide, am I going to step out and do what God is asking me to do, or am I more comfortable where I'm at? But as we step out in faith and obedience, God reveals himself, and his kingdom breaks into our everyday lives. Other people's lives are touched, and we grow closer to the Lord. Can anybody say amen? I've found that to be true. Yes. Jesus exhorted us to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. And I believe that we also need to ask the Holy Spirit to give us eyes to see what our Father sees. When we see something or someone that tugs at our hearts, we should be like Moses at the burning bush. <laughs> we should turn aside and pay attention to see what God is doing or saying. That burning bush or that situation, that person, that sad, lonely, needy person is our invitation to join our awesome God in his work. What does this look like in real life, Pastor Cindy? Well, some of you know that I um, w spent time with an organization called Youth with a Mission. And uh, we spent some time in downtown L.A. And I tell you, downtown L.A. is a whole lot different than downtown Castlegar or downtown Udashenya, where I was raised. And uh, we went out into the streets and uh, just sharing the good news with people. And we came upon uh, who I thought was a young boy 
um, in these coveralls sitting in the street, not on the sidewalk, in the street. And he was filthy. He was shaking like a leaf. Uh, he was kind of drooling. And he had one sock and one shoe off. And he, he said, can somebody help me? Can somebody help me? And of course, you know, this is when there was a lot of attention on HIV AIDS. And um, I didn't know what was going on with this guy, but because my background was in special needs, I thought, I think this guy has cerebral palsy. And uh, so I wasn't afraid to reach out to people with special needs. And even though the smell was almost overwhelming, um, nobody else in the group was doing anything. I was like, somebody's got to do something. And so I went over and I bent down and, you know, that sock was wet. And I did not have gloves or a mask, friends. Bare hands. And as I helped this guy get this wet sock on his foot and then put the um, running shoe on, you know, I just was hit by how Jesus didn't, he didn't flinch, he didn't hold back. But, you know, I later learned that this was not a young man, that this was a young woman who was a crack cocaine addict and was in the DTs. And I was so naive. I didn't know. I didn't recognize those signs. But God calls us to reach out to the whosoever will and to the least of these, our brothers and sisters. Amen? As always, our most important and most powerful example of what it looks like to reach out to others is Jesus. Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. He literally wrote the book on it. Um, God reached down from heaven when he gave us his only begotten son, Jesus, wrapped in the frailty of human flesh. God didn't just send his son to the rich and to the famous, to the elite and powerful. Jesus was literally born in a barn. Sent to the least of his brothers and sisters. Jesus reached out to men and broke many cultural taboos by reaching out lovingly and respectfully to women. He sought out sinful, broken, rejected, marginalized, despised, and isolated people who were outcasts from the rest of society. Outcasts because of their grievous sins or hideous communicable diseases. Jesus went out of his way to go to places that others went out of their way to avoid. <laughs> you know, how, you know who, where those places are? Jesus once said, once said, I must needs go through Samaria. What do you mean, Jesus? No self-respecting Jew needs to go through Samaria. <laughs> we good boys and girls usually take the long route around. Why do you need to go through Samaria, Jesus? Jesus knew that at noon there was going to be a Samaritan woman, an outcast from her society and her culture there, hungering and thirsting for love, needing to know where she could find living water. And that is why he needed to go through Samaria. In Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, we read where Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. He wasn't just one of the, you know, lower down tax collectors. He was one of the high mucky mucks, elite, important tax collectors. And he was wealthy. Why was he wealthy? Well, because he was cheating people out of their money. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short... He could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached that spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately or hurry down now. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He is gone to be the guest of a sinner. 
But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Wow, that takes a lot for a rich person to say, doesn't it? Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus touched the untouchables. Do you know in India there is a caste of people called the Dalits who are considered the untouchables. They live in garbage dumps, literally. Their homes are there. They are the lowest and the low of the society there. But Jesus touched the untouchables, gently embracing shame-filled lepers with their oozing putrid sores, healing their broken hearts and bodies from the inside out. Jesus was so rooted and anchored in his father's love, so secure in his own identity and destiny that despite the censure of the religious elite around him, he did not flinch. He did not recoil or look away when a quote-unquote sinful woman burst into the men's dinner club and washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. He did not stop her as she poured out valuable perfume on his feet and kissed them. Instead, he acknowledged her presence as well as her act of worship. He told the arrogant, judgmental men who looked down on her and him for letting it happen that wherever the gospel would be spoken in the future around the world, this woman and her love for her Savior would be remembered. And here we are, some 2,000 years later, talking about that woman and her love for Jesus. Jesus was not too busy or too important to stop his preaching and his teaching in order to take up little children in his arms and bless them as he hugged and kissed them. How many of you are glad that we have some wonderful children with us this morning in our service? Hallelujah. You know what? God is ahead of us in all things. COVID-19 has not taken God by surprise. He's not scratching his head wondering what he should do next. He's way, way ahead of us, and he is calling us back to our anchor in him. He is calling us back to that true north he is calling us back to the true way of being the church not showing up at a place not segregating ourselves and delegating the teaching of our children just to an elite class of teachers but where we as parents are actively involved in what our kids are learning and we have that opportunity to talk with them about God's goodness amen how many of you are glad to have the kids with us this morning let's give them a hand clap amen kids we're glad you're with us Isaiah 61, uh, verses 1 through 3, is a beautiful portion of scripture which Jesus, when he was in his hometown of Nazareth, uh, was in the synagogue, and it was his family's turn to read from the scroll. And as he, he stood up and he opened the scroll, it just happened that the scripture reading for that day was this portion. And uh, Luke truncates it a little bit. I want to read uh, all three verses because I want you to hear what Jesus said. He said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He was talking about himself. Isaiah is prophesying about the coming Messiah. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness 
for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. How many of you know God knows who our true enemies are and he's got our back? Amen? To comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Anybody had any ashes in their life? God says he brings us beauty, a crown of beauty instead of that. To give them the oil of joy instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. How many of you as we worship this morning just felt any kind of heaviness or worry or anxiety lifting up off of you as you just embraced being clothed in that garment of praise and God's righteousness? Amen. Just wonderful. He says, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. How many of you know that oaks are big, strong trees when they grow up? They are anchored and they are rooted and they can withstand all kinds of storms. You know, I don't know about you, but as I, you know, am on social media and different things, we just become aware of a weakened society, if I may put it that way. I was looking at a post that was on uh, Facebook the other day of a new line of men's clothing that had been put out by a very uh, famous, well-known, uh, you know, clothier. I won't name them. And the person who, who shared it was kind of joking because in some ways it was a joke. But as I took the time to actually click on the link and go and watch, I was heartbroken. I was heartbroken, church, because there must have been about 20 men who were clothed in women's clothing, nay, verily, girls' clothing, scantily clad, makeup on their faces, Clothes torn, with women's purses on their wrists, as they marched around on the platform. Church, this is not a laughing matter. Our society is so lost that we don't even know who we are when we look in the mirror. We have allowed the emasculation of masculinity. And we wonder why families and marriages are falling apart or why people don't even bother getting married anymore. How we need Jesus. How we need the spirit of the sovereign Lord to be on us and reaching out and touching the lost. In Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, we read another account of Jesus. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. <laughs> How about that? It wasn't the religious leaders that were pressing in to get close to him. It was the worst of the sinners who were pressing in to hear this man from Galilee. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now, what was Jesus saying? Was he saying, you know, church, you're safe, you're in the fold. That's nice. But 
Jesus don't really care about you anymore. He's only concerned about the one or the two or the many, the multitude that are still outside of the fold. No, Jesus was talking to the religious elite who should have known the way, who should have recognized him as the Messiah because they were familiar with all the messianic uh, miracles that would only be done by the Messiah and yet they stood back and they judged and they rejected because in order to receive Jesus, they would have had to make some adjustments in their theology, in their lives, in the power that they wielded. Jesus was not talking about the 99 being those beloved children that are already safe in the fold. He is talking about those who think that they are religiously, uh, you know, pure and don't need God. God forbid that that would be any of us. We all need to come to the foot of the cross, amen? We all need the blood of Jesus to cleanse us. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, we read Jesus is still on the move. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. How many of you are glad that Jesus still heals all sickness and disease? Father, we just thank you that your presence is here this morning, Lord God, that sickness and disease cannot abide in your presence. Lord, we speak healing and strength and vitality in the name of Jesus, Lord, to every ache, to every disease, to every need in the body and beyond today when he saw the crowds he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd then he said to his disciples the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Yes, Lord, we say yes. Send out workers, Lord. Send up, raise up, send out, Lord. In John 20, verse 21, Jesus said to his disciples, this is after he had been resurrected and he came to them and he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you in the same manner that God my Father has sent me to reach out to the oppressed. I am sending you, my disciples, out in the same way. Just before he was taken up in the clouds before their eyes, in Matthew 28, verses 18 and 20, we read this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And here's the good news. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Have we reached the end of the age yet, folks? We're still here, so the age has not ended. He's still with us. He has not retreated. God is not social distancing. He is still with us, amen? Emmanuel, God with us. We read this passage, and some of us get into guilt and condemnation because we realize we haven't gone overseas as missionaries. What we need to understand is when in this portion of scripture that the word go is actually in the passive tense. It would be better translated as you are going. As you are going. As you're living your daily life. So it doesn't mean that we all have to sell our houses and go overseas, okay? But there are many nations that are overseas. And if God is calling you to go there, Join him in that adventure. I've had the opportunity to be in a number of different places, preach to 400 men in a minimum security prison in Kampala, Uganda, 
And to see a hundred of them stand to their feet uh, when I gave an altar call. To see men hungry and thirsty for the one who can make a difference in their life. Amen? You never regret saying yes when God invites you to join him where he's at work. The only active tense phrase in here is make disciples. That's what Jesus is concerned about. That's what his focus is. Make disciples. And you know that that's our focus here as well. Jesus didn't say make church attenders or pew potatoes. Right? He said disciples, make disciples, those who love, follow, and grow to be just like their rabbi, Jesus. How many of you are growing? Amen? We've maybe not uh, got where we're going yet, but we're not where we were. Thank, thank you, Jesus. We got our eyes on the prize. Romans 10, 13 through 15 tells us how we come into that place of being a disciple, how we come to salvation. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's awesome news, isn't it? It's not about uh, throwing money in the offering plate. It's not about whether you sing in the choir. Uh, it's not about all of these things, which are wonderful. It's about whether you're calling on the name of the, of the Lord. And uh, Paul there is quoting the prophet Joel. But he goes on in verse 14 to say, How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? <laughs> and how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And we're not talking about I just got a pedicure because it's my birthday. All right? How beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful are the feet, are the people who are willing to go where God says go who are willing to reach out and bring good news. Charles Peace was a convicted English murderer. He grew up in a good home, um, and he was severely injured when he uh, was 14 years old and ended up being crippled and kind of gave himself over to a life of crime. He ended up in jail a number of times and ended up eventually murdering someone. The day that he was um, scheduled to be executed. He was escorted on the death walk by the prison chaplain who was insipidly reading aloud from a book entitled The Consolations of Religion. And he was reading about the fires of hell while he's walking the man to the gallows. Peace burst out, Sir, if I believed what you and the church of God say you believe? Even if England were covered with broken glass from coast to coast, I would walk over it. If need be, on hands and knees, and think it worthwhile living just to save one soul from an eternal hell like that. Church, we need to ask ourselves, do you believe that there is a heaven and a hell? Does your life, do your conversations, do your priorities reflect that? When I was four years old, I went to Belgium with my family, and I was introduced to my dad's family, who were believers, but they had some cultural differences. Uh, they drank beer, they smoked cigarettes, cigars, and, and they loved Jesus. <laughs> but I grew up in a very, what shall we say, <laughs> holiness-oriented, legalistic church background. And by the time I was four years old, what I understood was if people were doing bad things like smoking or drinking, or wearing red nail polish or red lipstick. They were bound for hell, for sure. 
And so I was extremely concerned about my grandpa. Now, I was short. I'm short now. I was shorter then. And my grandfather stood over six feet tall. My parents went out and left me with grandpa and grandma babysitting. We don't speak the same language. I'm English. They speak Flemish. And when nobody was around, I took his tobacco pouch and I hid it down in the kitchen, in the cupboards, way back in the pots and pans so nobody would ever find it, especially not grandpa. And by the time my parents came home, my grandfather was having some withdrawal symptoms. He was sweating. He was really, uh, you know, getting a little anxious. And he didn't want to tell on his darling granddaughter, but he, he needed a smoke. And so he said, Jack, Kathy, I think Cindy, I think Cindy, it wasn't Jake because he was only like 10 months old. I think Cindy hid my smokes. So my mom threatened me within an inch of my life, where are those smokes? And I held out, I held out. And the pressure kept mounting. The persecution, church, was mounting. And finally, the final straw, do you want a spanking? <laughs> no. And so I got the pouch out, and my, my grandfather quickly made himself a smoke and went out in the backyard and lit up, and I was running behind him as fast as my little feet could take me. And uh, as he lifted that smoke up to his lips for that longed-for... <laughs> I jumped with all of the athletic ability in me to grab that smoke out of his hands. And I ended up burning my hand and I was howling and kayaing and it was just, it, it wasn't pretty. Now kids, you're listening and it's a funny story. But I tell that story because children understand the spoken and the unspoken rules that we project. Kids, I want to be completely clear. People do not go to hell because they smoke, or they drink, or they wear red nail polish, or red lipstick, or they've got spikes in their hair, or tattoos on their face, or earrings through their nose, okay? People miss heaven. God wants everybody to go to heaven, but people miss heaven when they say, no, God, I don't need you. Because there's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus. So God doesn't send anybody to hell. People send themselves to hell when they say, talk to the hand, Jesus. What risks, church, are you willing to take for the kingdom? To see people set free and brought into life more abundant and life eternal to come. 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verses 14 through 21 says, For Christ's love, we talked about love last week. Christ's love, not my love, not my insufficient, wavering, sickly love sometimes. But true divine love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and who was raised again. Church, do you understand that this is not about our best life now, about Cindy's best life now? I mean, yes, he comes to give us abundant life and we will have our best life, but that is not the focus. We live for him, amen? We live through him. He has his being in and through us. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Hello, Zacchaeus. Welcome to the family. Hello, Samaritan woman. Welcome to the family. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry 
of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Church, we have got to get this into our hearts because as we see evil and wickedness mounting in the world, there is a temptation for us who know Jesus to start shaking our fingers in sinners' faces and telling them how bad they are and that they're going to hell because they're not Christians, because they're not holy. That's not the good news. The good news is that Jesus died for each and every one of them. Amen? Jesus' heart, the Father's heart, is to bring us close, is to reconcile us to himself. That is the good news that needs to be on our lips wherever we go. Amen? Christ not counting people's sins against them. When they accept him. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might be become the righteousness of God. In closing, one more scripture, Philippians chapter 3, verses, the second part of uh, chapter, uh, verse 12 through 14. Paul is, is writing to the Philippians. He says, I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to take a hold of it. <laughs> what? You're kidding me. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, you haven't taken hold yet? <laughs> what hope is there for us, eh? But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Church, as we prepare to leave this building or the comfort of our homes, wherever we're watching, we are going into a world where people are harassed and helpless. They're hurting and so very, very confused, seriously confused. They are anxious, fearful, stressed, depressed, and demonically oppressed. Jesus called them sheep without a shepherd. Who is the one that the good shepherd is laying on your heart today? Do you sense his heart do you hear the urgency as he says, for this one, I laid down my life and rose again. For this one, I came to bring life and life more abundantly. Earlier, we watched a video clip of young men joining hands, linking hands together to make a human chain so that they could reach down the steep sides of a canal filled with turbulent, rushing water to rescue a poor, frightened dog that was in danger of being swept away. As we go about our lives this week and every week, may we live out the words of the old hymn, Oh, to be his hand extended, reaching out to the oppressed. Let me touch him. Let me touch Jesus so that others may know and be blessed. That is our prayer. It is a simple one. Let's go forth and live it out. Amen. God bless you. We look forward to being with you again next week.